Well, we want to welcome in those who are listening to us on the Internet to let them know we're glad that they've joined us. And along with those that are here this morning, good to see all y'all's faces. Just thrilled to be here. Amen. Well, we have been talking the uh, last three weeks. We've been talking about getting to know Jesus. We, we started off where Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You shall find rest for your souls. Amen. And he wants us to learn of him. He wants us to know who he is. And I know that I spent a lot of my youth growing up in church, and I trusted Jesus as my Savior when I was a young boy. Just because you just because you get saved don't mean you know everything about it. You're just beginning to know him at that point. And and I and I'll be honest with you, I did not learn about the Lord like I ought to at a young age. It took me uh Getting out, it actually is a sad, sad story the way it all worked because instead of being a follower, close follower in the beginning like I should have been, I didn't follow him like I should have, and I didn't, I didn't get to know him like I should have, and so I wasted a lot of my life, I wasted a lot of my year uh, chasing after stuff that had nothing to do with with what God wanted for me, and I wasted a lot of my life. I wasted it on on foolishness. I wasted it on things I don't even want to talk about this morning, but uh, but I thank God that he never turned his back on me. Uh, the Lord's always been faithful, and uh, but anyway, I want to know, I want to know him in his fullness. I want to know everything about him I can. I want to, I want to feel, I want to feel closer to him than I do anybody here on this earth. Amen. And uh, so this morning, we're going to do something just a little bit different. Um, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, we're going to read this morning about the birth of Jesus Christ. And I know most people say, well, you don't do that until December 25th. Well, here's the thing, and I'm just going to make it very short. Jesus was not born on December 25th. More than likely, Jesus was born in late September. Jesus uh, has nothing to do with the day called Christmas. Matter of fact, the word Christmas is Catholic, and it means Christ's death. And we're not celebrating Christ's death. Uh, we're talking about Christ's birth. We're not actually celebrating his birth today. We celebrate it every day. Amen? It's not that we pick out one day of the year to celebrate something. We're to celebrate him every single day we live. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Um, even as a family, we don't celebrate Christmas like the rest of the world does. Uh, we don't. We just don't do that. And it makes us kind of oddball to everybody else. But that's okay. Um, I want to. Once you know something, you can't unknow it. And once you know that something is not of God, the way the world does it, then you can't go back. And I have learned that that uh, what the world calls Christmas is not is not biblical. Uh, Christ, if He wanted us to celebrate His birthday, He He'd have He'd have left us a birthday, and He didn't do that. Uh, but but he wants he wants us to honor him in every part of his life, every single day we live. But anyway, we're going to look at this. We're going to look at the birth of Jesus Christ. And what I want you to see in this, what I want you to see by this message, we're talking about getting to know Jesus. I want you to see, listen, Jesus is the opposite of what the world pictures as religion. He's the absolute opposite. Uh, what the world's, when the world talks about religion, the world thinks about big, fancy, huge buildings and, 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 and super nice furnishings and and uh, lighting and sound, and, and when they think of, of church and, and religion, that's what they think of. And a lot of times, gold stuff everywhere, big elaborate, uh, ornate decorations. That's a stark contrast from Jesus Christ. Let's look at it this morning. Luke chapter 2, and I'm not going to get in a hurry reading this, but I, I want to just, I'm going to pray before we start because I'm not going to stop after I start. Let's pray. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you, Father, for the Word of God. Lord, I don't know which direction you want me to go with this message this morning. I just know this is what you put in front of me. And Lord, I just want you to I just want you to use me this morning. I want to be a blessing to those who hear. Lord, I want to be a blessing, Lord, not only to those in this room, but Lord, to all those who are listening uh out on the internet, Father, wherever they may be. Lord, there may be somebody listening in this morning who's never ever dealt with their eternal uh their eternal state. Lord, they don't know if they died this morning, Lord, where they would spend eternity. Father, there's so many people in this world that are lost without Jesus. And, Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, if somebody under the sound of my voice, Lord, 
hear us the message, Lord, and I pray the Holy Ghost would take the message and, and, and show them that Jesus is the only way to salvation. He's the only way that we can come to God. Lord, I pray this morning that, Lord, they come to realize this is the day. This is the day God has shown them, revealed to them who Jesus is, and that they need to believe on him and trust him, and, and Lord, have, have, his, have their sins washed away in his blood. And, Lord, I just pray that this be the day of salvation for somebody. Lord, I pray for us this morning. Lord, if we're here and we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, Lord, we, we, we still need to hear that same old story again and again. Lord, it just blesses us to know him, to know that we have been born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And, Lord, I just pray we rejoice over it again afresh today. Please help us and bless us now. Meet with us in Christ's name. Lord, take control of me and use me for Jesus' honor and glory. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Verse uh, Chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass, and by the way, before we do that, I want you to notice the verse right before that. In verse 80 of chapter 1, it says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. That's what we talked about last week. It's John the Baptist. And again, we talked about last week. I know a couple of y'all weren't here last week. We talked about John the Baptist. His entire ministry, from the day he was born, until the day he died, was nothing but pointing to Jesus Christ. Lived out in the desert, lived covered covered in a camel hair garment that, that I'm assuming he probably tanned out himself. I don't know where he got it, but anyway, it was a rough old garment. And he had a leather girdle around his waist, kind of like we see Tarzan in them old movies, you know, leather thing around his waist. That's what he had around him. And, and he was out there eating, the Bible says, locusts, which is grasshoppers. He eat grasshoppers. He wasn't worried about getting something fancy to eat. He wasn't worried about fancy clothes. He wasn't worried about a fancy place to live. He wasn't worried about anything but preaching the message that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah was coming, the Lamb of God was coming, which takes away the sins of the world, and his message was repent. In other words, turn from your way, your wicked, sinful way, and turn to God. And that was his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was coming. And his whole life, was like one of these signs you see on the side of the road that's got the flash and arrow pointing. His whole life was a flash and arrow pointing to Jesus. And that's who we were talking about in verse 80 there, that he grew up and he, he was in the deserts or out in the woods, out in the wilderness, out in the places where nobody lived, out there preaching to people that would come and showing them unto Israel that Jesus was coming. All right, so verse 1 says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor at that time, that all the world should be... Well, I just love taxes, don't y'all? I bet you, I bet you they did back then, too. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed. Everyone into his own city. So wherever you was born, that's where you had to go back and file and pay your taxes and all that. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. You know, it's kind of, it's not amazing, but it's just interesting to me that Mary was also of the lineage of David, and here Joseph is of the lineage of David. Now, they were different, I mean, it was different bloodlines and whatnot, but, but, it all came through the same bloodline. Even though Joseph wasn't his real father, he was his earthly father, he was still uh, out of the house of David. The Bible says he, that they went to be taxed. He went to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Now, she went into labor. And she brought forth her firstborn son. It's worth noting right there. I, I'm just going to kind of preach as we read this morning because there's so much to be seen in this. And this is not your normal, ordinary sermon with points and outlines and all that. I just feel like preaching the Bible this morning. Amen? She brought forth her firstborn son. Do you realize what that means? That means the Catholic Church is, is lying to everybody because the Catholic Church claims that Mary is a perpetual virgin, that she was a virgin from, uh, she's always a virgin. They deify her. They make her into a, a, to a god. They make her into someone to be worshipped. And she was nothing more than the vessel that God chose to bring Jesus into this world. And the Bible says her firstborn son, which means he wasn't her only child. She had other children. After that, the Bible tells us of that too. So don't believe this Mary the perpetual virgin business because that ain't true. Amen? 
So anyway, she brought forth her firstborn son. And I just, I, I try to picture it in my mind's eye when I read. I don't just want to read it like a newspaper. I want to put myself in the story. I want to put myself around behind that little old, little old inn and the backside of it. And probably just, I, I just picture it in my mind, just, just rough lumber and, and just a place for for, for a, a, a mule or donkey to be stored, a cow to be, an uh, ox to be stored. And here they were in this little stark, dirty floor, uh, dusty uh, place with just, just with other, with animals around them and everything else. They had nowhere to go. So they crammed into this, they crammed into the, to what looked like a little old barn on the backside of it. Can you picture that? Here they are. Picture Mary. Mary's swole up pregnant and she's in labor. And Joseph knocking on that door saying, hey, my wife's in labor. Can we find a place where she can have this baby? And they're like, no, sorry, there's no place for it. By the way, there's not, there's not much place for Jesus in this world anyway. The world don't want Jesus. Amen? It's a picture of that. And it's that, that the world has no room for Jesus. The world still has no room for Jesus. Jesus still gets pushed aside. And people minimize him. But yet... There was no problem. He was a king. He was a king of all eternity. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, coming into this world. And what did man do? Man says, no, you go out back with the animal. And so that's where Jesus Christ came into this world, not in some fancy hospital, not in some palace, but no, he came back there with flies and, and, and dung and, and animal hair and animal dander and everything in the world that could have been nasty. There he was, born in that condition. Amen. Kind of, kind of make you realize that Jesus Christ did not come. Jesus Christ did not come just to just to uh, reach the wealthy and the and the uh, well informed. He came to the he came, he was out back. Amen. That's who Jesus is. Jesus came to those who couldn't do anything for themselves. Amen. And she took him and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. She wrapped him up best she could. And she laid him in a manger. Let's don't forget what that is, feed out. I mean, I've, 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 I've poured a lot of feed out in my life. I've, had, I've, done, I've done a lot of barn doing. And that's not where you want to put a baby. But that's all they had. Because there was no room for them in the end. But I want to get to this part here. I want to get to verses 8 through 20. Because here's the part that talks about the shepherds. The Bible says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And I want to put myself on that hillside in my mind. These shepherds, I don't know what they're doing. They're probably sitting around the fire out there, probably sitting around talking. Stars are out. They're just enjoying a nice evening, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the Bible says, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Can you imagine what that was like in a pitch black dark night? And here they are sitting around a campfire out there with their sheep all sleeping on the hillside. And all of a sudden the heavens open up. And all of a sudden the glow of a, I don't know if it was a glow or what. I'm just assuming it was a glow. Amen. A beam of light from heaven. Here's All of a sudden here's this angel of the Lord right, right there with them. And it must have blown their ever-loving minds. The Bible says the glory of the Lord shone round about them. It all got different in a hurry when God showed up. And the Bible says they were so afraid. It scared the living daylights out of them. I ain't never seen nothing like that in their life. I mean, so afraid. I mean, it was terrifying. For the angel said unto them, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, don't be afraid. This, this, for behold, I'll bring you good tidings. I'm bringing you some good news, guys. This is this ain't gonna be scared of. This is awesome. These are this is great news, good tidings, good news of great joy. Oh, this is gonna make you so happy. Oh, this is gonna cause you such great joy. This is what shall be to all people, not just to you guys on this hillside, but to everybody who will know about it. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You see. It had been prophesied ever since the beginning, ever since Adam and Eve sinned. God told them what was to happen. He told them that, that there was a that there was a Messiah coming. He let them know. They'd been talking about it ever since Adam and Eve, all down through history. Listen, Noah knew about it before he got in the ark. Listen, they, they knew about it on the other side of the ark. All down through history, this had been proclaimed. Then they when they set up the tabernacle and they brought in 
they brought in animals to sacrifice them. It was all about Jesus. The blood that was shed was all about Jesus. Listen, as as they went on and built the temple, and they say on the on the Day of Atonement every year, it was all it was all about Jesus. All the blood that was shed was all about picturing that He was coming, and He's here. He's come. This moment in time in history that everyone had been waiting for is finally here. And the angel said, "And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped wrapped in swaddling clothes." Lying in a manger. Now, this is the part that really gets me. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. Now, stop right there. Let's understand just what happened. I want you to get what they saw. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, I'm going to turn over real quickly. I want to read it to you. It's it's a recounting of uh, also of what happened there that day. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. You can hold your place if you turn there because we're going right back. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6. The Bible tells us now that suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts. Chapter 1, verse 6 of Hebrews, the Bible says, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God Worship him. All. A-L-L. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 5 that there were 10... Well, let's look at that. Revelation 5.11. Quickly, I'll turn there and read that to you. Revelation 5.11. The Bible says, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts of the and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's what showed up out there on the hillside of the shepherds. All the angels of God, all of them showed up in the sky that moment over them as the angel of the Lord tells them, you're going to go down there and you're going to find Jesus, and he's laying in a manger in a horse in a horse trough out behind that little motel. But all the angels of heaven, all of them showed up to announce it. I can't imagine I'd like to. I'd like to picture it in my mind and get myself in that moment and realize just how glorious that moment was. And the Bible says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. All these angels praising God on that hillside. I mean, I can't. it just gets me excited just thinking about it. I mean, that's the same scene we're going to witness someday standing in heaven. We're going to see all them angels and singing and praising God, and we're going to join with them there. But praise God, they came down to earth to do it for Jesus that day, amen, that night. And they were praising God, and here's what they said. They said, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace. Why? Because the Prince of Peace had come into the world. The Prince of Peace who came to undo the damage that Satan caused. The Prince of Peace who came to bring men out of darkness into the marvelous light of the Word of God. The, the same God who came to bring peace to those who are troubled, to, get, to bring peace to those who are in distress. And the Bible says goodwill. Listen, when God gets involved, when God's in control, there's not evil will. There's only goodwill. God only seeks to do us good and not harm at all. Listen, thank God Jesus came. Thank God he came to set men. The Bible said, and it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste. I mean, they took off running. Amen. They got, I mean, they were excited. Can you imagine all the heaven, all the angels of God singing around them and telling them what's going on? Well, they took off for town. They found that motel. They walked around back and lo and behold, they said, hey, let's go, let's go into, they, they made haste and the Bible says, and, and, and they and they and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. I'm gonna tell you, once I once I saw that he was the Savior, I couldn't quit talking about it. Amen. I mean, listen, when you come to know Jesus Christ, when you come to know that he's able to deliver you from the power of sin and death, when you come to know that he's able to take an old wretched, vile 
sinner like you and change them into a child of God that is, has no more sin before God's throne evermore, ever, ever, ever. God can't ever find another one of my sins because Jesus has washed them all away. The Bible says he took my sin and he cast them behind his back. He threw them away from him as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says he cast, he cast it behind his back for his own sake. He remembers them no more. I praise God for that. Amen. Amen. Listen, I'll tell you something. I know I'm a miserable wretch. I know that. Me and Mama was talking about that last night. We are talking about, you know, I, I was bragging on her, and she said, don't brag on me. And and, and I, I feel the same way. I don't want somebody bragging on me either because I know what a wretched old mess I am. You know, she was saying, I get up every day, and I intend to live and, and not do the same old Make the same old mistakes I made yesterday. And she said, "I don't want to get, I don't want to get be grassy and grappy at everybody." She said, "Before the day's over, I end up doing it anyway." Listen, I and I said, every one of us has got a, we've got a series of faults, triggers that we that we we end up hitting before the day's over. Usually, we say, "Hey, I don't want to do that," or "Please help me not to be that way," or "I don't want to do that." Please keep me from doing that again today. And lo and behold, something will happen, and we'll come to the point where we end up doing the same thing we we meant not to do. And I tell you, it's a, it makes me feel miserable by myself. It makes me sometimes look and say, God, how in the world could you love me? Because I, I, I make the same mistakes over and over and over and over. But you know what? That's why he needed to save me to begin with. Because I am a mess. You're a mess. We're all a mess. We all got the same kind of, I mean, maybe different problems, but they're all problems. It may be different faults, but they're all false. It may be different sin, but it's all sin. Listen, we've all got it. We're all, that's why we had to have a Savior. I'll never forget her telling me that a long time ago. I came out of, it was, it was a night that I came out of living for myself, and I started living for God. Listen, I was already saved, but I've been so backslid of years and years of backsliding. And God finally rung my bell. He finally showed me that I was to live for Jesus. And that night, I remember talking to her on the phone, and I said, you know, I just don't understand. I don't understand how he can still love me, how I can still be forgiven after all I've done. And she said, that's why you needed him in the first place. Amen. Praise God. He's able to do, he's able to cleanse the vilest among us. Amen. And so these shepherds, they couldn't contain it. Amen? Listen, when you finally see who he is, when you finally come to understand who he is, you can't contain it either. you got to tell somebody. And they went and told everything that they'd heard concerning this child. Verse 18, and, and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Amen? You may not think you're doing any good telling people about Jesus, but I'm going to tell you something. It does more good than you think it does. Hey, listen, those that heard it, they didn't understand it all, but they said, hmm, there's something to that. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know, I think about Mary sometimes. I think, we were talking about this too last night. We, were, You know, that was her little boy. She raised him. She, He got up every day and she probably made him something to eat. And he sat there at the table and, and talked to her and, and, and went about his day playing or whatever. Or, uh, uh, however, I don't know what all he done, you know. But listen, he was just, a, he was a, he was her little boy. But he was also the Savior, and she knew it. What an odd situation she was in. She had to be his mother, but at the same time, I mean, she never had to get on to him. She never had to fuss at him. He he was perfect in all his ways. He never sinned, not one time. Can you imagine that? I think about that sometimes. His, he did have brothers and sisters. Can you imagine? They'd get in trouble. They'd say, well, he... No, he didn't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's his... No, it's, it's, I did it. They couldn't blame him, amen? I mean, I'm sure sometimes they got aggravated because he was always perfect. They probably said, he don't ever do nothing wrong. He, he don't. Amen? He's perfect. He's a Savior. Hallelujah. But Mary kept all these things. She pondered them in her heart. She thought about it. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. You say, well, now, now, where are you going with this? I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to read about these shepherds before we turn over here to our other passage, which is in John chapter 10. Turn there with me if you would. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He wants us to, again, to learn of him. And in, it's not, I don't think it's ironic at all that Jesus used this, this example of the shepherd and the sheep. It's 
it was the shepherds that he came to very the very first thing. The shepherds were the first ones to know. Isn't that odd? He didn't go to kings and priests. Who did he go to? He went to shepherds. He went. And what is it about a shepherd and a sheep? The the idea of a shepherd and a sheep. The sheep. We know sheep. Sheep can't defend itself. Sheep has no defenses. It's a completely defenseless animal. It's not a very smart animal either. A sheep will get itself hurt. I have heard, I don't know that it's true, but I've heard if you had sheep in the back end of a pickup truck going down the road, if one of them ever decided to jump out, they're all going to jump out. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I've heard that. They're not very intelligent animals. They have to have care all the time. They have to be guided. They have to be led. When they wander off, they have to often be, be punished severely in order to know not to wander off again. We're like sheep every single day we live. I mean, we're def- listen, we got an enemy that wants to destroy us. The devil, he, uh, listen, the Bible talks about it. The thief cometh not before to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil wants to tear us to shreds. He wants to destroy our lives. We've got to have a shepherd watching over us all the time, and that shepherd is Jesus Christ, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. The Bible says here in John chapter 10, Jesus said, these are the words of Jesus. He said, verily, verily, which is truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Let's talk about the sheepfold tonight. It's the barn. Okay, this morning it's the barn. That's what we're talking about. The sheep, where the sheep, where the sheep enter in and they find safety. He said, "He said, whoever doesn't come in the door, he's a thief and a robber. He that entereth by in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Shepherd don't go in the he don't go in the hayloft. He comes in the door. He doesn't sneak in. Well, what do we? So I, I've, I've had I ain't had sheep, but I've had chicken. And I know I know I, I always went in through the gate. But you know what? He let a skunk or a possum. He ain't gonna go in through the gate. He's gonna climb in some other way. And he's going in there to kill and destroy." And that's exactly, Jesus is telling them, look, <clears throat> well, I'll just, I'll, I'll make it a little clear. The Bible says, to him, the shepherd, the porter openeth. In other words, he sends his boy to open the door. He sends his helper to open the door. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. See, the sheep know the sound of their of their shepherd's voice. Uh, you, could have, you could have two or three different shepherds, and two or three different flocks of sheep, and they're all watering down by this watering hole. But when that one shepherd, one of those shepherds gets ready to leave, he calls to his sheep, and his sheep are not going to, uh, the other sheep from the other shepherds, they're not going to mistake that voice for their shepherd's voice. No, the shepherd that calls out the sheep, those sheep and only those sheep will come out from among that watering hole and follow after their shepherd. Just like those that are Christ are going to follow after him. They're not going to listen to some false teacher and believe him because they know they don't belong to him. Listen, we're not to be fooled by, by, by the tricksters, the charlatans of our day. And there are plenty of them. There are plenty of, of, of false teachers out there. There's plenty. And I, I tell you what, I'm thankful to God that I'm saved. I'd hate to be lost in this day and time and trying to find the way because there's so much error. There's so many lies out there. And the gospel is so simple. The word of God is so simple. He said, when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Again, they follow him and won't follow another. Jesus said, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's so, it's so important that you read your Bible. It's so important that every day, look up here, kids, you listen to me, you pay attention to what I'm about to say. It's so important that you read your Bible. It's so important that you know what God has said to you, what Jesus has said to you. Because we live in a day and time where people will deceive you. People will say all kinds of things and try to twist things to make it seem as if God is saying something other than what's in this book. But I'm going to tell you right now, listen, the Joel Osteen's of this world, the T.D. Jakes of this world, the, the, the Kenneth Copeland's of this world, all of these big money TV preachers, 
who are just taking people's money and ripping them off right and left. Listen, they'll tell you lies. They'll tell you things that ain't so, and I can keep on naming them all day long. Basically, if they're big shots and they got a big TV program and a bunch of folks sitting in a big auditorium, you might as well know there's something wrong or they wouldn't put them on TV. Amen? Those who preach the truth ain't going to be on no big shot TV show. <laughs> the Bible says, verse 6, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. They didn't, they didn't quite understand what he was saying when he told them, listen, the only, the only voice you're going to hear is the voice of your shepherd. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. He said, listen, what did he just say up here a while ago? He said, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as as a thief and a robber. He said, I am the door. In other words, I am the only way that you're going to find what you're looking for. I'm the only way. There's no other way to come to God. That's what he was trying to tell them. He was giving them a a word picture to to paint this in their mind, this parable. A parable is a heavenly, it's an earthly story which teaches the heavenly truth. And he was trying to show them, look, you're the sheep. You you need the shepherd. And if you listen to anybody else, you're going to be in trouble. And I'm the only way. Amen. I'm the door. He said, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Listen, I'm going to tell you, here's the great thing about Jesus Christ. Listen, he gives. Amen? He doesn't take from you. He gives to you. Amen? Thieves and robbers, they come and take everything you got. They may promise you something, but they're going to, they're going to take something from you. False religion, that's what it does. It promises you something, but you know what you end up doing? You end up working and working and working, and in the end, you get nothing for it. I feel sorry. I really feel sorry. For the, for the people who are called Mormons in this country because they're following after a false religion. They're following after a man called Joseph Smith who won't do nothing but lead them straight into hell. I feel sorry for the Jehovah's false witnesses of this world because they're following the teachers, teaching of a man named Charles Taze Russell who won't do nothing but lead them straight into hell. I feel sorry for the people that bow down and worship that, that vile man, the Pope, over in Rome. Listen, he ain't going to do nothing but lie to them and tell them they got to work their way to God, and they ain't going to do nothing but serve and do all and pay money to try to keep people out of hell, and, and they ain't going to do nothing but end up in hell themselves because they're liars, they're thieves, and they're robbers. That man over there wears that funny hat. He's not the door to the sheepfold, even though he claims to be. Listen, he claims to be Christ on earth. I'm telling you there, this world is full of thieves and robbers. There's only one way. He said, I am the door. Not I'm not a door, I'm the door. You're not going to get to God, but by me is what he's saying. Amen? He said in John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen? I've said it a lot of times, but you know what? Usually everybody's got got one cup at home that they like to drink out of. I mean, most people do. I used to have one of them hospital mugs. I really liked them. That's why I don't think going to the hospital is good for it. Get you a mug. Isn't that right, Miss Charlotte? <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> but, <laughs> but you know what? That's your cup, isn't it? He's pointing at you. You got a cup. And you know what? If you say, hey, Ronnie, go fix me a glass of tea and put it in my cup. You're talking about a particular cup. I want that cup. Not, don't come in here with some other glass. I don't want that. I want the cup, right? So that means it's a genuine article. That's my cup. Amen. Listen, Jesus said, I am the way. There ain't, you can't, don't tell me how well. I'm a good person. I'm going to get, I'm a good, if anybody went to heaven, so and so did because they're a good person. You ain't getting to heaven because you're good. There's none good. Amen. This, that, you, you can't work your way to God. God, you can't erase your sin. You can't do a thing about it. It's there. The only one that can do anything about it is Jesus. And he said, I'm the way. You can't find it anywhere else. Amen. Jesus said in verse 9, he said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Amen. Hey, listen, I like that phrase, got saved up. I never forget me and a, me and a, me and a, a brother named Terry. I can't remember. I'm trying to think of his last name. Doesn't matter now anyway. He was from uh, Kentucky, and I was in Bible college with him years ago. And uh, me and Terry Terry Hunter that was his name. 
and he he came by and picked me up. And he said, "Hey, I'm gonna get take you visiting with me." And we went to we went to uh, Gilmer, Texas, and we went walked all over, I drove around and, and and walked all over Gilmer and knocking on doors. And I remember us knocking on this one lady's door and standing there talking to her in her old sandy yard. I remember standing there and uh, we were talking to her about being saved. And she said, "Well, I'm not saved, but I'm safe." I said, "Really." She said, yeah, I don't think anybody be saved. She said, but I'm safe. And I said, what in the world are you talking about, ma'am? She said, well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, you get to, you hit a home, I mean, you hit the ball and you get to first base and, and you're, you're safe. She said, and then, and then, you know, and then we run over to second and then we're safe. And then, you know, I said, well, ma'am, there ain't but one problem with that. We ain't playing baseball. I said, we're talking about life and death. We're talking about eternity here. And Jesus didn't say, I'm safe. He said, saved, amen. Saved means it's finished. It's done. It's over. Ain't nobody mess with it. It's done. It's finished, amen. And Jesus said, hey, I'm the door. If any man enter in, how do I enter in? I have to come to Christ. There's no other way. How do I get to Christ? God has to show me I need him. I've never, listen, people, we call people that are not saved, we call them lost people. Do you know why we call them lost people? Because they don't know where to go. They're lost. They don't know Jesus is the only way to heaven. They don't know the only way they can come to God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. They're lost. You know what? They're in darkness. Jesus said, come to him. He's the light of the world. But they're in darkness. When you're in darkness, you can't see where to go. Jesus said, hey, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out. You know what? He's got liberty there. He's got freedom. You know what that means? That means, hey, there's liberty and freedom in Jesus Christ. Some people say, well, if you get saved, then, then boy, you just, it's just a lifetime of do's and don'ts. And do's and don'ts. But I thank God he gave me freedom and liberty. Yes, I need to follow him. I need to do that out of love. But, but listen, being a Christian ain't dull and drab and boring. I, I've had a whole lot more enjoyment since I've been a believer than I ever did before. I praise God. There's liberty in the Lord. The Bible says he should go in and out and find pasture. You know, I, I mean, you want to talk about sheep down there uh, grazing in the pasture, or cows? I drive by them on the, in a pickup truck, man. They don't look like they're stressed out to me. Looking at a herd of cows out there eating eating green grass, man. They ain't they, they got a pretty easy life. Amen. You know what? There's peace. They got peace. Ain't nothing bothering them. They're they're in the safety of their uh, of their pasture, and 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 they're just enjoying. Being in God's creation, amen? Listen, God wants us to, to not have everything just pressing on us all the time. There's joy in the Lord. There's liberty in the Lord. And he goes on to say in verse 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. See, the thief don't want you to have that. The thief doesn't want you to have liberty. The thief doesn't want you to have peace. The thief doesn't want you to have joy. He wants to take that from you. Listen, the thief wants to take all that from you and make you make you in bondage. Listen, if one of those little sheep was stolen away and taken uh, taken away from the shepherd, that sheep is in bondage. That sheep is it, it, it's, it's, its existence is threatened, and and the devil wants to separate you off from the family of God and get you over there and make you miserable and make you in bondage. Listen, God never intended for that. God never intended for a child of His to be in bondage. He wants us to know, listen, we need to follow him. We need to listen to his voice. We need to follow after him and enjoy the peace that comes in knowing Jesus and having him watch over us and be our shepherd. He said, I, I'm come, they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. That, that phrase, more, more abundantly, it means beyond the bounds of expectation. It's like you went over the fence and just kept going. It's just further than you can see how good things can be. God, when God is real in your life. He said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. What did he give? He gave... He gave his own life, didn't he? He laid down his life for us. He gave his life for us. The Bible says, but he that is a hireling 
that's just a paid servant and not the shepherd who's on the sheep or not, see if the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and flee it, and the wolf catches them and, shat- and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he's a hireling and careth not for the sheep. You know, Jesus was talking about the religious folks of his day there. Those who are just filling a role. Those who are just trying to uh, trying to be a religious person. Listen, I thank God. I think that I was never deceived in false religion. I thank God, but I feel so sorry for all those that are. I feel so so heartbroken for those who, who are who are this morning just turning out of some false religion headquarters, out of some Mormon outfit or some whatever. I listen, or pulling out of some church that preaches a false gospel. I hurt for them because, listen, I know how good it is to know Jesus. I know how good it is to have him as my Savior. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known of mine. Listen, I know him, and he knows me. Praise God. I I, I want to know him better, but I know him. And what I've known of him makes me want to know him more. Amen? And I praise God. And, and he said, and he knows me. Amen? There's so much here we could preach, and if I start on it, I'll never finish. But I just... <laughs> I want to say to you this morning, he knows you. There is no secret in your life that God doesn't know. There's not any part of you that you are ashamed of that God doesn't know about. And he still loves you anyway. You may say, how could he love me knowing how I am? Because he loves his son, Jesus Christ. That's why God loves his only begotten son. And his only begotten son was put in your place and was punished in your place. Took your punishment. God punished him for you. That's how he shows you how much he loves you. What love he had for us. Greater love than anybody's ever had on this earth. I thank God for my mama. I can honestly say my mama has loved me more and longer than anybody that has ever lived on this earth. I thank God. She's the one who shared with me the message of salvation. She's the one that was there and led me to Jesus Christ. I thank God for her, but she don't love me like God does. Nobody's ever loved me like that. And he knows me. He knows my weakness. He knows he knows what I need. He knows my needs. Listen, and all he wants me to do is come to him and say, Father, I need this. Father, I, I have needs. Father, I, I, I need you. Father, I need strength. I need wisdom. I need to understand. I need I need help in, in, in knowing how to treat other people. I need I need help to love those who are hard to love. I need I need help to forgive those who hate me. I need Lord, I need I need to be able to forgive people. I need all that. And he's the only one that can provide those things. He's my shepherd. He he says, come on and go with me and learn of me. And as I go through the pages and as we continue on reading and studying, listen, we're going to see how, how it wasn't about him, it was about others. He came for them. He didn't come. Jesus didn't come to be some big shot. Jesus came and humbled himself even though he was the God of all creation. There's never been a more humble human being on this earth than Jesus Christ. He said, as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father, know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Praise God. In verse 16, very important verse, and he says, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. You know who he's talking about right there? He's talking about all of us here this morning. You see, he's talking about Gentiles. I, I don't know about anybody in this room, but I can tell you with, with assurance I'm not Jewish. Don't have a drop of Jewish blood in me. I don't know if everybody else in here is the same way, but you know what? I'm a, what the Bible calls a Gentile. And at that time, listen, the Gentiles had not even heard that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. But Jesus, being God, being eternal, uh, he, he's, he's telling them what's to come. He said, I have sheep that are not this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. It does, listen to me. There's not a Jew in Israel today who's, who, who is coming to God because they're a Jew. Every, 
every single person who ever draws a breath on earth only comes in one single solitary door, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the door. There's no other way. There's no getting in by birth. There's only one way. Verse 17, he said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. He came to die, folks. He didn't come to live. He came to die. No man taketh it from me. By the way, they didn't kill Jesus. They couldn't take his life. He laid it down. He said, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. They couldn't kill him. They beat him worse than any man ever been beat. You know, it's amazing to me when you really think about what all Jesus went through for us. I mean, I mean, first of all, they beat him with rods, which basically would have been like beating him with bats. They, 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 they took and they punched him as hard as they could. And, and, and they beat him with their fists. They cleared their sinuses and they spit snot all over him. They reached up and they took his beard and they ripped his beard hairs out of his face. They took a, a, a they took thorns from a, from a from a vine that had huge thorns. They're not like little thorns like stickers. They were thorns like locust tree thorns. And they braided that 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 crown and they shoved it down into his head. And those thorns dug into his flesh and they beat that thorn, crowny thorn down into his head. Listen, they took him and they tied him up to to to, to be whipped. And they took that cat of nine tails, which was braided leather, which had pieces of metal and pieces of bone. And, and they took that, and, and they would take it, and that guy would rear back that whip, and he'd whip, and it would lash around Jesus' body. And those pieces of bone and metal, like fish hooks, would dig into his flesh, and then that man would take his foot against something, and he would pull back, and it would just rip, just furrows in Jesus' skin, made ribbons out of his flesh. And they hit him with it 39 times. Now, I ain't got no calculator, but 39 times 9. That's how many slices were in Jesus' body because of that. And yet he did not die. Any mortal man would have bled out there on the spot. But yet he did not die. No, they took him and they mocked him. They laughed at him. And then they took and they put that cross on his shoulder and made him carry it up Calvary's hill. And yes, uh, yeah, there was a man that stepped in and took and helped him carry it. But listen, he still went to Calvary and he still was nailed to that cross after all he'd gone through. And he hung there on that cross, bleeding, and yet he did not die until he said he gave up the ghost. All that was for me. All that was for you. That's love. He didn't have to. He could have let us perish. He could have let us burn forever in hell. He could have said, you know what, man, man is a waste of my time, but that's not who God is. He loved us. And he laid his life down for us. And I want to to finish up right here. I want you to look down the page. Verse 22 and following. The Bible says, And it was at Jerusalem at the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. That was out out on the outer thing there. And, And then came the Jews round about him, these were, again, people who were trying to catch him, people who were trying to trip him up. People were trying to find a way to say, aha, now we've got you. Now we can take you and kill you. Now we can have you put to death. These people were trying to catch him up, trying to get him caught up in his words, trying to, to do their best. And they came around about him, and they said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, then tell us plainly. They weren't saying, hey, we're looking for the Messiah. We hope you're it. No, they're saying, huh, hey, go on and tell us who you are. Tell us you're the Christ. Tell us you're the Savior. And then that we're going to call blasphemy on you, and then we're going to prosecute you. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. You see, everything Jesus had done was exactly the way it had been prophesied. I mean, down to the very letter. Everything in this book points to who he is. Everything. Every picture, every type, every foreshadowing, everything points to him. 
He said, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. He said, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. You know why? Because here they were. They were the religious people. They were the crowd that thought that by keeping the law, which they couldn't do, they could never do. We were talking about that on the way up here this morning. JD was talking about somebody sharing with somebody else. Oh, we just got we've got to we've got to keep. The, they were trying to witness, but it wasn't coming out very well. They were saying we need to we need to keep the Ten Commandments, folks. You can't keep the Ten Commandments. There ain't none of us in here who've ever kept the Ten Commandments. Not a single one of us. You know why? Because every one of us in here, one time or other, told a lie. Every single one of us. I don't know if every single one of us in there stole something, but I have. I mean, I'll never forget being. I remember the first time I stole something. I stole a little combination lock from my from my step grandmother's store because my my step brother had one and I wanted one too. He was getting one for his school locker. And I thought I ought to have one too. And I took it home. I snuck it home and I kept it under my bed. I don't know what I was going to do with it under my bed, but I'll never forget how embarrassing it was to have to go back and tell her I stole that. Listen, we've all done things we shouldn't do. <laughs> You say, well, I've never committed adultery, but I guarantee you, hey, I guarantee you, you've looked on somebody with lust in your heart. And Jesus said, when you do that, that's committing adultery. You say, I've never killed anybody, but you've been angry enough to. Yeah. You say, well, I've never, I never worshipped a false god. Oh, wait a minute. We've all, at one time or another, put things ahead of God and made an idol out of them. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. Listen, praise God, we can't keep it. And yet there are people who think they're good enough to get to heaven. They're fooling themselves. They're lying, just like these Jews that circled around Jesus and tried to trip him up in his words. He said, you believe not. You don't believe who I am because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. He said, my sheep hear my voice. Let me ask you this morning, can you hear his voice? Over and over and over and over, Jesus said to the crowds that heard him, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know why? Because a lot of people, it was going to go in one ear and out the other. A lot of them stood around hoping that he was going to do some kind of miracle and they'd have food to eat, hoping he was going to do some kind of miracle and heal people, but they weren't interested in the message of salvation. They just wanted the goodies that came along with being around Jesus. They didn't hear his voice. They didn't realize that they were worthless without him. They didn't realize that he came to save them from their sinful ways. Listen, Jesus Christ came for, with a singular purpose, which was to rescue men and women out of their sins. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I pray to God he knows me. Amen? He knows me. He knows me because I'm his. He don't lose nobody. Jesus don't make mistakes. If you're his, take comfort in that. He ain't going to ever lose you. Amen? Listen, Jesus over, there's another passage where he says, he said, many many in that day will say to me, Lord, we've done great things in in your name. We've prophesied. We've cast out devils. Lord, we've preached in your name. And he's going to say to them, I never knew you. Now think about that. I never knew you. You know what that tells me? He never did. It wasn't that he did and they messed up and they lost it. He never did. So that tells me if he ever knew you, then you're still his. Amen? If you ever came to him, and in and, and repentance and faith, believing that he's the Savior, that he died for you, that his blood is there to wash your sins away, and you believed on that saving blood, then you are his today. You can't lose what you have in him. And I'm going to prove that to you right here in just a second. Verse 28, listen to this very closely. Jesus said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Let me show you this illustration, and we're going to wrap it up. This picture is you right here, okay? This little Sharpie pen. We're going to pretend this is you. You came into this world a sinner. You were born in sin. There ain't nothing you can do about it. You were born into Adam's race. 
a sinner. And from the very moment that you came out of your mother's womb, you started a journey falling toward hell. And without being saved, that's exactly where you're going to wind up is in hell for all eternity. And and if you are born again, child of God, at some point on during that fall, you heard his voice and you knew that he was the only hope you had for heaven. And you called out to him and said, Lord Jesus, please wash my sins away. Save me. Save me from, from, from my sin. And he caught you. He came and he caught you. He's got you. Jesus said, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I saved them. You're in his hand. You see that? Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And look at verse 29. My father which gave them me, the Father, which sent him into this world, born in that manger, grown up, preaching the word of God, preaching preaching the kingdom of God, warning men of the judgment to come, preaching that they should repent and believe on him. He came into this world to save sinners. And he said, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I am my Father are one. He's saying, I'm no different than him, and he's no different from me. If you've seen me, you've seen him. He said, I'm in, they're in my hand, and neither shall any man pluck them out. Now, I'm going to clear up some things right now, because I, I know a lot of people who said a lot of things, and a lot of preachers have said lots of things. There are people who say, yeah, you may be in his hand, but you could jump out. Oh, wait a minute. That sounds real good to somebody who wants to keep people scared and and, and, and bully them into coming to church every week. But if I'm in the hand of the Lord, I don't think the Lord's going to be careless with me. Now, beyond that, let's look back at the Scripture, because it doesn't matter what you think or I think or any preacher in any other church thinks. What does the Bible say? Let's look at 28 again. And I give them eternal life. How long is eternal? Forever. There's no end to eternal. I give them eternal life, and they shall, when shall they perish? Never. Okay. That little old word in English, never. We know what it means. But if you take it to the, if you take it back to the Greek, he's saying. I know a lot of people get. Uh, there's a lot of preachers that probably uh, maybe some listening to me this morning say, "Don't do that. Don't confuse nobody." But I'm going to tell you something. So there are four words that make up that one English word, never. It means not at all, at any time, or any place, whether they be male or female perpetually or eternally ever perish. That's what it means. Covers in everything. There's no way. He said they shall never perish. Why? Because I saved them. I've got them. They're in my hand. I have saved them. And he said, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, that word pluck, we know what that word pluck means. That means you're pulling on something and it's holding on, and you've got to be strong enough to pull it out. Just like, I don't know how many of you here plucked a chicken feather, but I have. I, I know I've plucked hairs out. I pull them out of my ears often. I hate that. It's one thing about getting old. I can't stand the hair in my ears. But but you pull, we've all plucked a hair. And when you pull on it, it holds on. And that tells me right there, he's got me. And he said, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I can't tell you how many people I've stood and talked to on a doorstep and tried to get them to see this truth. <clears throat> and I always ask them these things. I say this. Are you stronger? Uh, let's see. Is, is there any body on earth that's stronger than Jesus Christ? Because you're in his hand if you're a child of God. And I always ask him, have you believed upon Jesus? Are you trusting him as your Savior? Yes. So you have eternal life? Yes. Okay. So is anybody strong enough to pluck you out of Jesus' hand? Well, no. Well, wait a minute. What about the devil? The devil's pretty strong but is he stronger than Jesus? No, Jesus already beat the devil. He whooped him with a big ugly stick called Calvary's cross. So can the devil pluck you out of Jesus' hand? Never. That only leaves one person left. One person. And that's you. Because see, there's lots of people say, well, I, I could, well, I could walk away. I could do this. I could do that. Well, are you stronger than Jesus Christ. Are you ever going to be stronger than Jesus Christ? Ever. Let's be honest. Are we stronger than Jesus? 
So how in the world are you ever going to get yourself at his hand? Never. So according to, not according to me, not according to religion of the world, not according to the devil, but according to God's own word, when can a child of God ever lose their salvation? Never. Man, that make you want to shout right there. That make a dead, dry old Presbyterian want to go, mm, or something. I mean, hey, hey, praise God, man, I'm saved. I'm his sheep, amen. He's my shepherd, amen. I found the door. I got pasture. I got liberty. I got freedom, hallelujah. It ain't never, ever going to go away. He said, learn of me. Well, I tell you what, the more you learn of him, the more excited you get. Amen? My hope and prayer this morning that you're saved. If you're not, you need to be. And I want to tell you, it's very simple. It's just believing. I had a young man up here the other night I was talking to. I was witnessing to him. And I told him, I said, the only, I, he said, what I what I need to do then? Because I, I was telling him about he needs to be saved. And he said, well, what I need to do? I said, there ain't nothing you can do. It's not something you can go do to be saved. You gotta believe. You gotta believe God. You have to take Him at His word and trust that what He said is true and believe. God has showed you. If God reveals it to you, don't say, No, I don't want to hear that or no, I don't believe that. Believe Him, trust Him, and be born again. And He'll wash your sins away. And He'll change you forevermore. Will you fall down again? Sure. But you know what? When you fall down, you'll get back up and keep going. Amen. I thank God the shepherd don't leave the sheep when the sheep stumbles. The shepherd's there to help the sheep along. Get to know him. He's our Savior. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning. I just praise your name, Lord, for the blessed gospel. I thank I thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ, Father. I thank you this morning that I'm his child. I'm your child. Lord, that nothing can change that. And, Lord, it's not because of anything I've done, but it's because of what you have done through the Lord Jesus Christ for me. Lord, I just praise you for these that are here this morning. I thank you, Lord, for their fellowship. And, Lord, I pray that, Lord, if we are saved, that we'll, that the Lord will seek a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Christ, that we'll get to know Jesus. And, Lord, as we get to know Jesus, Jesus will show up in our lives for other people to see. Lord, that they might know that he is the truth. He is the way. He is the life, and he can change a life. Oh, Father, please work in our lives. Please help us to recognize opportunities to talk to others, to share with them that Jesus can change their life forevermore, that Jesus can can wash their sins away, that Jesus can make them free from the penalty of sin and death. Lord, I just give you glory this morning. I ask you please to continue to work on hearts and lives. Continue to draw us to yourself. Father, before we close, I plead with you for our country. Lord God, in the next few days, we're going to, Lord, we're going to decide who's going to lead this nation and whether they're going to lead us in your direction, Lord, or whether they're going to lead us to destruction. And, Father, I know we don't deserve mercy. I know we've, we've done nothing but, but, Lord, shame you. Father, I just plead with you, have mercy, Lord God. I pray that, Lord, there's enough, there's enough God-fearing people in this country who are calling out to you that you'll spare this nation. Father, I just plead with you, please, for our children and grandchildren's sake, please spare our country. But Lord, more importantly than that, I plead with you for those who are under the sound of my voice who are facing an eternity without Christ. Holy Ghost of God, convict them, draw them, show them that they need Jesus right now. And Lord, I pray today be the day of salvation. I ask you, Lord, to bless us now as we dismiss. Father, we just pray that you watch over us and take care of us until we meet again. And we give you thanks for all of it in Jesus' name. Amen.